What's up, everybody? Today, I'm honored to have creative acquaintance Neil DeGrade of the rock band Dirt Poor Robbins in the Yours Truly Virtual Studio. I first encountered Neil and Dirt Poor Robbins on my pilgrimage to the summit, the symbolic world summit, earlier this year. Dirt Poor Robbins is a musical favorite of Jonathan Peugeot, the icon carver, and the philosophical mind behind the symbolic world creative initiative. Peugeot, a modern meaning maker heavy hitter in this little corner of the internet, invited Dirt Poor Robbins to provide the musical entertainment to the Symbolic World Summit, and also invited Neil to be a keynote speaker at the breakout session, which I attended. During the Dirt Poor Robbins concert, which was excellent by the way, I spotted the Jordan B. Peterson in the back of the auditorium. At the relatively small conference attended by only five to 700 people, and I made the decision in that moment to shoot my shot. I introduced myself to Dr. Peterson, so the moment of meeting Jordan Peterson approximately seven years since I first saw Peterson on YouTube was set to the soundtrack featuring Dirt Poor Robbins with Neil DeGrade absolutely slaying on his electric guitar. So when I saw that Dirt Poor Robbins was going to be an opening act for the leg of, for a leg of the We Who Wrestle With God tour featuring Jordan Peterson, I decided to shoot another shot and ask Neil to come on the Yours Truly and talk about that experience and have a chance to establish a relationship with fellow Sojourner and artist scratching out the path to rebuilding and re-enchanting meaning into this flat and vacuous state that we find ourselves in currently. I attended Neil's talk at the summit about creativity, and I took this note. The glory of God is to conceal a thing. The glory of a king is to seek it out, Proverbs 25, 2. This is the kingly journey I joined Neil on today, the journey to seek out the goodness and glory of the lost world a deep, profound meaning as we think out loud together. And I think it's even the kingly spirit and archetype that Jordan Peterson truly represents, seeking out the X that marks the spot of treasure, following his maps of meaning to wherever the Holy Grail might be. So, without any further delay, I'm excited to present to you all today, Neil DeGrade of Dirt Poor Robbins. Hi, this is Christian Baxter. And you're listening to Yours Truly, a place we go to think out loud. Thanks for coming on today, man. Man, what an intro. That was so professional. I, you know, I always assumed the YT was YouTube, but now Yours Truly, now it has like double meaning. Well done. I like that. Well, it was YouTube because when I first got on here, it was just like four random numbers, you know, and uh, oh, I was yeah. like, and I was trying to like do something and I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to be YouTube, Christian Baxter YouTube. And then when I was like a few, when I started trying to do some more stuff, I was like, maybe there's something else here. And if I was going to have a podcast, well, I could put a name on it. YT, YT. And that's just kind of, that's what came out of it. And it, it, it means something too, you know? We were talking backstage. Yeah, you were like, yeah. Why, why'd you start doing this? And I'm like, well, I made this huge mistake in my life. I really, you know, uh, <laughs> and had to rebuild it. And this is kind of part of that journey. And so, um, but yeah, dude, uh, that's about me. I, has, I had you on. Talk about you. <laughs> um, who's Neil DeGrade? <laughs> well, that's a good question. That That is my name, right? Identity. Um, so I think that what I want to make Neil DeGrade not is like the lower identities, I guess, like, hey, I'm a musician, I'm a guitar player, songwriter, filmmaker, whatever. Um, those things are, are, are things that I do. Uh, but it was, I was real careful when I started getting into art um, originally because I could feel my first love of music and making and making things that I, that I really wanted to see or hear. Um, I could feel that getting kind of robbed by the way the world can kind of try to use identity as like a commodity. So I've worked hard over the years of like trying not to like think of myself as like a songwriter, even though that's something I do in the sense that my value is not wrapped up in those things. So um, my value is not going to be, and my identity is not going to be these particular lower things that I do. My value is what I was created for. What's my real name and what's my purpose here? And uh, where am I going to, where was I made to be at home? Um, in this world. So that's kind of where I'm at now. And that's kind of everything we deal with in, in music is about that. But to go backwards, I guess when people ask that question, they kind of want to know a brief story. 
And so uh, to go quickly through it, uh, I grew up in a family of entertainers, um, which should be no surprise to anybody when they meet my family that everybody's an entertainer. Everyone sings. Our Christmas parties were intimidating, four-part harmonies <laughs> for guests that came to visit. People would bust into song. There was lots of laughter and joking. My dad had the number one radio show in the mornings where I grew up. Uh, my mom was a jazz singer. And so we were. I was kind of bored and bred into this, but nobody had a coerced me into it either in the sense that I think they did everything they could to keep us out of it because they knew how hard that industry could be not that there's no potential in it but just the like literally if you're an intelligent person there's probably at least a hundred other things you could do that you might be just as happy at and be more successful uh, because entertainment can be such a wild ride and it also attracts all strange types of people so my parents did their best to shield me from that but man I couldn't stop making making art music. I think the first time I realized why I was making art, I was really young. I was about five and my parents had gone to see in a movie called Jaws 2. And when they came back, I was so into great white sharks and stuff. I really wanted to see this, you know, shark just rip through people. And so that was not something my parents were going to go let me see. But I was like, hey, well, can you tell me the plot points of the movie? And my mom told me the plot points of the movie. I went, I went to my room, I got a bunch of poster board, and I drew basically a storyboard for the whole movie as she told it to me, and I'd show it to her. And I was like, I made the art because I wanted to see the story. So um, that, in a nutshell, has been like my entire career as an artist, is that I think that I managed to protect it as something I love, not just as a, uh, a business or something I do it within the industry, although it is a career, but I think I really have maintained over the last however many years I've been doing music, the desire to create because I want to hear it, uh, create because I want to see it. And I think that if I, if, if my heart's in the right place and I'm moving towards God, like cool, really interesting, or interesting things are going to come out of that. I don't think that, uh, I focus art as a Christian in the sense that it's like some kind of substitute sub to some better art that the world makes. I think that we have access to true meaning and that true meaning really will put a lump in your throat better than anything else. So um, that's kind of like, I guess, a, a weird way of uh, kind of telling my story. Um, I, I grew up as an artist. Uh, I was also an athlete, too, and I kind of had those two things competing uh, for a little while, but, uh, you know, I met my wife and she kind of settled me down off all that because she's a singer and she's been an entertainer, uh, her whole life as well. So, um, that's how the band got together, you know, uh, Bill and Ted, Preston Esquire, Wild Stallions. When, AKA when Herbal was Robbins, that? Kate when me. was that? When did the band get together? Well, yeah. Okay. So, well, Kate and I, uh, get, we met because she was, um, she was living in Los Angeles. I was living in Providence, Rhode Island, and um, kind of as a joke and to get a ride for my friends who were going to be going a direction of, um, that I was planning on going, uh, we auditioned for a musical. There was this nationwide search for the leading man in this musical called Rage of the Heart, and I auditioned as a joke, and I goofed off the whole time I auditioned. Uh, I just tried to make the judges laugh and my friends laugh and didn't take it seriously at all. I got a phone call the next day that I'd gotten the part, that their search was over. I'd gotten the part. And I was like, I'm not going to do a musical. Like, I'm, I got other things going on. This is not, I'm sorry that I misled you, but I just auditioned for fun. And I think I auditioned better than I would have because I didn't care. Like, I had right. nothing about it. And uh, there was no nerves or there were no stakes. So anyway, they, the, I turned it down, but the, the writer of the musical called me back. And he said that he overrode the judges because when he saw me, he knew I was supposed to be with the leading lady who they'd cast in Los Angeles she was beautiful, an incredible singer, wonderful person. You're really going to want to meet her. He, uh, that guy talked me into sticking around just to meet Kate, it turned out. So uh, he saw something there and cast me in the role so we could be together. He, the he was right about the chemistry, that's for sure. She was a much better singer than I was at the time and uh, probably a better songwriter already. So um, definitely lyrically. I didn't, I was one of those people that never focused on lyrics and she was all about the lyrics. And so we kind of put chocolate and peanut butter together and try to make Reese's, you know? I relate to that. My wife, we've done music together. Most of our relation, we met in high school and, uh, did, you know, I'm very much more like a melody person and she's very much more a words person. And so, you know, mm -hmm. we haven't done a whole lot of writing together, but that relationship has been similar in that way. Um, so that's how you guys met doing uh, a musical together. And, and that's, I guess, 
where Dirt Poor Robbins was birthed as well, because y'all are a do y'all are a team, y'all are a, a, a collaborating partners with with that project. Do you consider Dirt Poor Robbins like everything, like your whole creative endeavor? Is that like the whole thing? It's not obviously just music. Is it everything, or do you have like other ways that you divide that? Yeah. So what happened is in 2004, we made a like kind of like a I would have called it a demo, but we printed it to CD and uh, living in Providence, Rhode Island at the time. And it right out of the box. It sold a ton, like to the point where we're like, oh, we don't need another job. And it got interest from record labels and things like that. So we decided to go into that, signed a record deal. But realize that with a record deal, it's going to be kind of hard to make money because they're spending all this money and you don't make money until they're paid back. So we went from making like, you know, like doing really well to signing a record deal, no fault of the record label, just the structure of the business um, to being like, oh, we don't have any money right now. We probably won't for a while. So um, that was, <laughs> you know, that was one of those uh, mistakes we made. But anyway. Um, okay, so going back around 2004, the band, yeah, so I would say 2004 was our first record, but we did not go full-time for a while. I worked as a producer, writing songs. I wrote a lot of, like, um, you know, songs at, like, worship retreats and stuff like that that churches would sing, and uh, my name was on. So I had a bunch of published songs there, and so I had some income from that, income from working from artists, income from working, um, stuff getting licensed, and every once in a while, like, a, a physical art or video project. Um, but it was around 2017 where I couldn't not do Durple Robbins all the time anymore. It was to the point where there was nothing I could do for someone else where I would get paid more than if I just made a new song or record for us. So that was my crossover point um, where it was just like, well, you know, why would I do this? And, and then, too, when you're working for other people, sometimes you're butting your head against the wall. It's really nice to have the company and to, you know, collaboratively move forward on something. But, you know, a lot of artists might relate to the idea that like, oh, when you find your first clients, for example, you're just the best musician they know. You're not necessarily the right musician for what they want, and they might not even know what they really want. They just know they want something that other people have something that they need something to. And so you end up in this process of helping them figure out what they like, which means doesn't matter how talented you are. You, uh, it's going to take a long time to get through that process. So that could be really frustrating. Um, so I did that, but anyway, but since 2017, I guess we've been doing just pretty much Durpal Robbins. I'll do small things here and there to help out friends. I've helped Jonathan Peugeot out with some videos and some music and, uh, I pick up a little work. I'm working on a podcast right now, music for Christianity today. Um, it has to deal with the satanic panic. It's like Durpal Robbins. And if you're familiar with Striper, like the huge Christian rock band from the eighties, they're, uh, the other band. So, which is kind of weird. Um, but I love it. So I'm doing that, but I, I take only take on like one or two projects a year that aren't my own right now. And we're just trying to figure out how to keep up with, uh, the growth because it's a more work than I can do just to manage the, the audience at this point. So I'm going to have to eventually go back into the road that I've kind of avoided, which is, uh, the record label road, the road where people like, you know, you're hiring publicists and, uh, I don't like the model of paying someone who doesn't necessarily do anything for you or them taking money. And uh, I like positions where people uh, eat what they kill. So like a manager, it's nice. He gets your work. He makes you money. He, he gets a piece of that. If you don't make any money, he doesn't make any money. Um, so we have to move into that kind of side of the professional life of things, which is a, a total distraction for me. It's not where I ever want to think and it's not what I want to do. I'm capable. I understand how it's supposed to be done. It just, I, after like three days of doing logistical stuff, I just, I'm like, maybe I don't need to live for that much longer. Maybe, maybe I've done enough in my life and I don't need to do this. I can go be a cashier. Um, so I, I get really, I get, I'm super happy as long as I don't have to, uh, to, uh, you know, engage myself in repetitive, depressing, boring activities. It seems like, even around that time, you were saying like the early, the early aughts, whenever, uh, there was still, I remember the, the word, dude, they got signed, you know, like that was still like a, mm -hmm. you know, like that was the, that was the, the goal was to get signed. And, and, uh, there wasn't a lot of, uh, easy ways to get information like we do the, today. A lot of people understand that that's actually, you know, it hasn't been a good deal for artists for a long time. Yep, exactly. So getting signed was turned out not to be. We were already making great money. We were already doing it before we got signed. 
It's the fact that if a label is smart, they want to partner with Momentum. So they don't want to just go out like they used to. It's just find a talented girl or guy somewhere, hook them up with their songwriters, throw them in their studio, into their engine. Like, you know, Motown would do this, and they were great at it, and they were pushing out classics because there were great people there. Um, but the problem is when the great people aren't there, it doesn't work. So the other side of things was in the 70s, there was this big push towards like really, really trying to smash things into a genre. Instead of having a label, having a hard rock band and a disco band and whatever, they would become like a, you know, disco label and then try to find disco artists. And so there was a different idea of like trying to chase uh, instead of letting inspiration and the new wild thing hit, it was like trying to ch trace uh chase trends so that wasn't particularly helpful uh in the label world so yeah we've been trying to avoid all of that in this industry so there's the thing about the industry is that people were expecting that like oh if i get signed it was going to work it was like kevin costner in field of, field of dreams like if i build this everybody's just going to show up but that's the equivalent of what happens a lot of the times it's uh you know the label finds a talented band hopes they develop into something they don't band makes zero dollars you know label loses money label finally gets a successful band and uses that to pay for all their failures and so the successful bands get burnt too because they're paying off all the mistakes the made the label made that's the other part of the agreement so that's um that's a pretty rough model and then now you have access to all the things that the labels used to only have access to it's like where do i find a distributor to distribute my record how do i form a relationship with music stores to get my music in there? you don't need to worry about that anymore so there's kind of almost no point to letting someone just shave off your money who's got an incredibly low batting average as far as turning out successes. Um, other thing about that, too, is that talented people, like, I mean, there's only a handful of people in the world that consistently write a good song. Um, those people used to sit in these labels and farm out songs, you know, and uh, farm out songs for the big artists. And people want to do their own music now. Like, you know, bands, it's like, oh, we're not real if we don't record our own music. So you're going to have a limited number of great things um, with those type of bottlenecks in place. So, yeah, again, we've avoided we've avoided that side of the industry. I think the industry, it's just kind of filthy, too. It's dirty. Even on the Christian music side, it was really like, I don't know, some of the worst people I was around, I think, might have been involved in, in some of those things. So it's not what people... Uh, think it is, especially if you want to be a family man um, and you want to, you know, have like I have four kids. Like, I don't want to drag them on the road with me. I don't want to take them to rock shows. Um, and I certainly don't want them hanging around the people you're working with in Nashville. So <laughs> it's uh, it's it's tricky. Some great people, some not great people. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm ranting about the music industry. I think people know what it's like. The The vision of we're going to form a band, a song's going to appear on the radio, a label's going to sign us, we're going to make billions of dollars is a really bad plan. That's not a plan. So don't think of it that way. Do it because you love music and you can't find anything else you love doing as much and figure out a way to make it work, like which is that you can have access to instead of waiting for a label to come in and save you and somehow make you famous, which you're not ready for. You're not ready for in character. You're not ready for any of that. And probably nobody is. I mean, yeah, it's so true. Uh, the Sorry. people want the youth, you know, the youthful beauty to prop up, you know, and, and they're not, equipped they don't have the wisdom and, and the character probably to to deal with being put in that place there was something in there and that was making me think what are your thoughts on taylor swift oh my gosh like dude so here's the problem with this question i love that this came out of nowhere so i'm just gonna go for it um i I really try to be generous when I see other successful things in music, you know? So when I see something, even stuff I would never listen to myself, I'm like, Hey, listen, I like not my cup of tea, but I can totally tell why people like it. Um, Taylor Swift. I can't, I just can't, I can't figure it out. Like, I mean, I can figure it out. I have guesses, but they're pretty, they're, they're not the kind of guesses of why it's working that make me have a lot of faith in humanity. So I try not to think about it for too long, meaning that, um, yes, she's she's definitely I mean, she's definitely tapping into something. Right. I, you know, I don't buy into this whole like there's some kind of hypnosis involved, although music is hypnotic in general. Like you can notice when music comes on, people will move and they are not even realize they're moving yet. It's like, who told you to do that? Who told you to tap your foot? What's really going on? A parallel dance to music. So there is I understand why people would want to say that there's some kind of hypnotic quality what she's doing. Um, she's resonating with what seems to be like a rotating, um, 
cycle of people that are 14 to 15 to 16 that grow up and then stick with her. Um, so I think she's, she's really kind of captured that mindset. Um, but I think it's part of a general pattern that kind of bugs me in, um, in our times. And that is the notion that really the most successful things in adult world were very often made for kids or, uh, tweens, you know, so, uh, Vesper Stamper was talking to me about how she writes for that audience. that kind of like preteen, uh, early teen ye- years, um, and teenage audience. I said, Oh, you're writing for adults now because that's how people, that's how adults think they process like what a teenager would have when we were younger. And so I think there's just that pattern you can make a case for. It's like Harry Potter was written for kids. Twilight was written for kids. Um, you know, the uh, Hunger Games was written for kids. Like, I don't mean kids, kids, but I mean, people like that aren't adults necessarily. And these are like some of the most popular series with adults as well. So I think that's not necessarily a problem, except I think with Taylor Swift, it is. I think it, there's kind of an arrested development. It's like, you know, like Jordan Peterson says, grow the hell up. Like everybody needs like. The, the stakes are much higher than this life, like getting back to your boyfriends or writing songs about that and these lower things. I understand why they're captivating to people because they're stuck in that world with you, Taylor Swift. Um, but hopefully our what we call stars can be sort of some like a beacon to show us some kind of higher pattern of living, not uh, just validate our low states of immaturity. Um, so there's my uh, there's my hot take on Taylor Swift. Why'd you make me do this? This is terrible. I'd never talk bad about musicians, but... I can't do it for Taylor. I can't, I can't, I have to say what I think. I think it's a problem. I guess for my, I've got 14 oh, year old. You're frozen in the best Joker smile right now. <laughs> I've Sorry, got a, you got frozen I, again, it, but it froze a, you. I wish I, I got a screenshot. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a 14 year old daughter. I've got a 10 year old daughter. Um, This idea of like a, a shared experience, the monoculture, there's so many limited things now that people are sharing in that they're Mm -hmm. they're conglomerating around people like her and so the biggest event of the year the super bowl that featured you know guy sports taylor swift every on the commercials every every commercial whether it was state farm or dunkin donuts had a-list actors in it it wasn't like that when i was growing up you know when you were that you know it was a funny Budweiser commercial or it was a funny Doritos commercial, but that was like the only time everybody's yeah. eyes are actually on something. So she's, I think, filling a space, like in this uh, mono in the in the kind of blue church monoculture that, for better or for worse, she this is that time. I so I mean, there's something too that she has a long catalog. You were talking about the, um people getting caught you know she has songs from when she was 14 or 15 that my 14 or 15 year old likes you know from that age that and you can kind of grow up with her quote unquote grow up from neil degrade's version you can grow up but i think that's part of the phenomenon um so i want to i want to shift to kind of this uh conversation meaning the meaning crisis which this is part of it but uh you developing a relationship with Jonathan Peugeot. How did that happen? You know, and that obviously, uh, I think coincides with you uh, getting on tour with, uh, with Jordan Peterson. So like, what's that story, your connection to this space? Probably around the same time, probably around the same time um, as you, I became familiar with Jordan Peterson. Actually, it might've been a little bit before he was kind of infamous, um, because I was looking for uh, anything that dealt with symbolism because we've been dealing with in our artistic language for so long. You go back to our earliest content we were rele- released and it still like matches this kind of symbolic coherent pattern. But I had kind of assumed that I was kind of making it up because it didn't exist in Protestant circles where I was. And so it was always treated with suspicion, although often treated with wonder and amazement. So I, I, I spent basically, I don't know, 20 years reading the book of Genesis over and over again prior to uh, 2010. And I knew that like the pattern for everything was in there. And there was this way that we were reducing these stories to um, something too small, um, you know, or moralizing or it, Christianity was really lost in moral arguments. So there's a book like, it's a fine book. It's like the book, like The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. 
And, you know, they're making these cases about like, oh, you know, Jesus had to have actually been dead because, you know, water and blood came out of the side of him and the water's lymph and lymph part of his lymphatic system. And we know, and it's like, you're missing the point. Like I never saw that that way. That's like a childbirth sign, water and then followed by blood. This is turning the water into wine. Um, this is, uh, you know, the, the wound there being uh, Eve being born out of Adam's side in the book of Genesis, like Adam falling asleep and then resurrecting with his bride. Uh, th this was the point of the story. The point of the story wasn't these lower things or like, you know, when these women appear to Christ, uh, they come to find Christ right after he right, raises from the dead. They make this kind of moral argument or kind of argumentation that, well, that would have been opposite of where the culture, they didn't like women's testimony at the time. So that was Christ validating women you know, so they use this kind of like almost like a modern liberal argument to say that, oh, Jesus was like he got it before everybody else did. And I, I find those uh, lines of argumentation to be a little dull. Um, I think that the better line of argumentation there is that like, oh, this is a restoration. She mistakes him for the gardener. This is a restoration of Adam and Eve in the garden. And so those patterns were of great interest to me. Jordan Peterson had written a book called Maps of Meaning that I started poking around in. I got some of it. Some of it didn't quite seem right. It, but then through him, I got introduced to John Bajo and I was like, oh, like we're having the same discussion here. This guy's thinking in the same categories and talking about the same things. Um, some people are naturally more ontologically oriented. They see the way things stack up this way, even even in a horizontal plane, horizontal plane among people. Like what's the difference between a king and a peasant, you know, a fool and a sage? Uh, how do these things match up and what's their proper ontological place? And Jonathan seemed to really have all of that down. And so I was looking for a way to kind of explain the things that I was already finding power in and finding power in them in the sense that uh, there's this moment in scripture. I try to compare it to this moment because it's like what it feels like when I feel like I have the right idea, when I have an idea. And it's like when Mary goes up the um, up the hill after she's just spoken to um, the archangel Gabriel and found out she's going to you know, give birth to Christ and that uh, she meets Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth meets her, like John the Baptist is in her womb and the baby leaps in the womb. And I feel like there's something like that when you, when you, when I started to play with uh, more of the symbolic language, um, this fractal language of the, of the universe where I felt like it would hit that spot or like, you know, um, I think it's Walt Whitman would say we get a lump in his throat when he had a good idea. So there was something about that and I wanted to understand why. So I wanted someone to explain to me why when I put things in the proper order and like something like what was beautiful to me or moving to me would emanate from that. So um, that's kind of why I got involved with him. So he and I ended up talking, I think on a Zoom call a while back. Uh, all the people around Jonathan are, you know, the other artists, it's, it's all pretty obvious why they're there. I'm always the one I'm like, why? It's not as obvious to me why I'm around. Um, but when you hang out with them, you realize, oh, these people, like, we all have the same problem. We've all had the same burden of we're trying to make sense of something that the world seems to have left out, uh, like, as junk. Like, the world just kicked this sort of narrative, mythic, epic, symbolic language and way of viewing things. Uh, just kind of kicked it to the curb for the sake of psychology. And it's interesting that a psychologist is kind of like one of the bridges back into that because, you know, the world really can't stomach philosophers or metaphysicians, but uh, it seems like it has no problem with psychologists these days. And so it's interesting that a psychologist, which was part of the problem of kind of uh, vacating the world from this sacred intellectual space, kind of brought it back. So, but all the people in Jonathan Circles are people that may have like a certain level of talent. Um, a lot of the people I just admire, some of my favorite artists in the world are part of his circles. So, um, you know, I think that it all... Everybody can just see it in each other when they see each other and they meet each other. It's like no one needs to explain it. Like when I meet Martin Shaw, no one needs to explain to me why he's awesome. No, actually, he's a terrible example because everybody gets why he's awesome. You know, he's not like a secret. Um, once you see him speak, you're kind of going to get it. You're like, oh, yeah, this guy remembers how we're supposed to tell a story and why we tell stories. And uh, what a, that's that's a shame that that's a rare gift now. But thank God for him. So I think that's. Uh, it's something everybody sees in each other. And so Jonathan is happy to introduce everybody he works with to people like Jordan Peterson. And obviously you talked about in your intro that Jordan showed up at our show uh, in Tarpon Springs and as, as a result of Jonathan. And then eventually we got a strange email from him inviting us to come out and play on tour with him. 
uh, which is a whole other story. But that's kind of how we got connected. So Jonathan and I were talking on Zoom calls. Um, I was actually one of his Patreons at first. And we talked and then we instantly started working together. Like it was like a couple of weeks and we're like, yeah, let's do stuff. And he had me on a Zoom call with his brother and we were making some plans. It was fun. That's awesome. You know, what is it? Deep calls out to deep. Um, I want to back up a little bit before, yeah, yeah. We, hit the, we, before we hit the Jordan Peterson uh, tour. You mentioned that you were like hanging around in the Protestant circles, that you had written some worship songs. Um, like what was that part of your life? Yeah. So obviously, you know, I'm an Orthodox Christian now, which is, um, which is very different. And I do feel in a, in a big way, grateful for what came before that, but also I felt robbed by it. Um, especially as an artist, it was easier to see per perhaps because, um, you grow up listening to, I don't know, masterworks, like whether it's classical, whether it's Stravinsky's Firebird, which I just kind of, uh, was inspired by recently, um, or, uh, you know, even some of the, even some of the simpler, um, Vivaldi pieces or whatever, these kind of things. And then you're listening to Beatles, Sgt. Peppers, and you're listening to Pink Floyd, The Wall, and Dark Side of the Moon, and Led Zeppelin IV, and I'm listening to all these records. That's not my favorite Led Zeppelin record, but it's one I actually had as a kid. And then listening to Queen, and then watching movies like Jurassic Park and Back to the Future, and there, there was like a there was a level of quality and excitement when I was thinking about music and art that was like so hard hitting. It was like it was a big deal and it could be awesome. It could really blow you away. But what was weird about all the things I just cited is that you don't really know. You don't necessarily know what they're about or why they exist. And there was a change that happened as soon as I became a Christian. I was you know, I mean, okay, so I'll, let me rewind a little bit. I was raised Catholic. We, we weren't particularly serious Catholics. I went to Catholic school growing up. Um, I had a hunger to know God better, ended up in a, a kind of a born again Christian church in high school. But as soon as I got involved with that, everybody gets excited when you can do things like, hey, this guy can play music, he can write. He can... And my instant encounter with the evangelical church and a lot of the Protestant churches was always pushing back kind of a gag reflex to the art. I don't want to pretend like I'm better than these people. And I think there are some incredibly talented people who are making some incredibly cheesy stuff because they thought they were being good boys and girls doing it. Mm. So there was this, and also this sense, like I remember the first time I went to a Christian bookstore and they were like, oh, I needed to buy music. My youth pastor told me that my music was garbage and I really shouldn't be listening to it. So I needed to find new stuff. And I told this to the person that, <laughs> bookstore and they tried to help me go find like oh who are you into you like acdc you might like this band blood good you like bon jovi you're gonna like petra and they started doing this kind of tit for tat kind of thing and the sad thing was is that there, those bands had stuff i liked but there wasn't a single thing that even came close to the bands that they were copying according to this this guy so there was this constant notion that the world's all about entertainment the church has got to be entertaining christians should be involved in entertainment but somehow we're kind of fighting with both hands tied behind our back because the actual power um, in these forms couldn't be inhabited with a Christian message. And uh, so there was always something very Thomas Kincaid, very kind of cheesy, very pow mighty morphing Power Rangers about even like the, some of the hymns and stuff. I don't know. It just didn't seem to be drawing from this place that other masterworks and artists were. And then you go back in time and you look at the churches built in Europe and you look at the classical composers you look at people like Cezanne who are perform who are composing for the cathedrals and you go way back and you hear stuff by Cassiani and 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 um, you know the Byzantine Empire at the time and it's just like dude there's just we're not in the same place like this is not what church art and church music is we're be dying to have an atheist show up and just decide to give his life over to God hearing our wonderful art. But they don't. They don't come into these churches to do that. They go and they pay top dollar to go to Europe to tour cathedrals and, and see all those things. And they'll go listen to classical music that has spiritual orientation. And they'll be blown away and they'll even have an experience with God um, doing that. And so the, the church vacated and abandoned for the sake of propaganda. And I think this happens, you know, I'm throwing so many different categories out there on you. Sorry, but... There's something happened in the in the the move over to making everything about marketing and advertising. I think that music and art kind of started to fill a propagandistic role where they were designed to move or sell something else for a, we, we commoditized it. And I think that was a terrible mistake. So that was my experience in the churches. So I'm I'm but I want to be a good boy. Like so you're there, you have gifts. Everybody's telling you to use your gifts. So 
every Sunday, I'm just holding back the gag reflex playing music and not complaining about it really to people, just offering stuff once in a while. Hey, maybe you could do more. Um, maybe there's something wrong here. I don't know why the way we do church, I don't see it in the Bible. I don't know why this is the thing. Um, so, but I... I always held myself in contempt for feeling that way. I never thought that maybe I was on to something. I thought I was maybe being snobbish or that I, it was, it was a, a part of my heart. I couldn't turn over and surrender to the whole process. And I was delighted to find out that I wasn't wrong. Like it didn't have to be that way and it doesn't have to be that way. And it's not meant to be that way. And it's a bad thing. It's a scandal that is that way. It's a scandal that people are calling their, uh, places of worship churches that are just absolutely low grade versions uh, of sanitized nightclubs and diet foods and NutraSweet and uh, chicken soup for the soul messaging. It's absolute travesty when you think about the depth in in this creation, even just in the natural world. And this is this is our best reflection of that. I think it, it it's gone so far off course to the point where it was embarrassing to call yourself a christian because people wouldn't think of what that really meant they would think of all of this garbage that christians have pushed out into the world so uh i'm in a particularly ornery mood on the subject sometimes and uh because it was it felt like it's such a treadmill to be in, in on that and really thinking that oh this music can change the world and it really can't beautiful things can i think that beauty uh and uh that sort of stuff does all point to god but uh, trying to enslave that for your own propagandistic purposes to smash it into this paradigm of transactional, like I'm going to hand you a little message and you're going to be saved because you believe this right, you punch the right numbers into the calculator. I think that's, that's a rip off. People who have been exposed to that as Christianity have been totally ripped off. They, they like that's not, the stakes are way higher than that. Life is way better than this. It's all, it all goes deeper and it's all, it's all richer. So I couldn't be happier to not be doing that. But I, at the same time, there's some Christian records I played on kind of liked. A couple of worship songs, I might still be tempted to sing it. You know, like, it wasn't all bad. It's just, it's so bad most of the time that it's, I, you, you got to look at it and be like, what are we doing? Like, what are, what are, what are we doing with this stuff? Why do we settle for this? You know, I think you ever feel that way. <laughs> man, my, my relationship to it all is very complicated because I was, born in 85 and my parents had kind of had a radical Christian transformation and or into the culture, like the Christian evangelical culture of the eighties and the nineties. I wasn't allowed to listen to anything but Christian rock. That was like, yeah, but that's what, Christian rock. Be, be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's why I was like, Oh, I get, to, I can listen to Creed cause they're talking about heaven. <laughs> Um, Can you take me yeah. higher? Yeah. So that that yeah. was I'm I'm still trying to uh kind of find my way through that actually. Um and this whole journey is is part of that. And um because I I'm so steeped and formed by the evangelical Christian culture of the 80s and the 90s. It's like it's it's actually like my whole foundation of like of development and so I, I i got right into the yeah the christian um worship thing i helped a church start when i was 16 because in our town there was somebody doing the christian music worship stuff in like the early 2000s except for me and one other guy and so they were like hey let's get this guy instead of pl push and play on chris tomlin on a sunday morning on a cd player so that my whole life has kind of been up until about seven years ago, completely formed by that whole subculture. And, uh, which I mm -hmm. don't have no like problems with you poo pooing on it. I still have to like understand the value and the good things that I, that are part of it. And you know, that you nodded towards, I have friends. The last guy that played in my band, he plays for probably the biggest Christian rock act that it's out there right now is their drummer. Uh, he he might even be one of the best drummers in Nashville, um, but he's playing for a Christian band because that was kind of the, you know, the way. And it's yeah. So I think that there's it's it is complicated in that. And I think that my 
when everything you're getting is a copy from the real thing, that my aesthetic sensibilities are stunted as a result. And I'm having to kind of understand that and work my way through that right now. Dude, so this is great. I'm, I'm so good. Like what you're voicing, I happen to think I know the problem. Like, and this is a solvable problem that you're going through because I went through it. I know other people that went through it and then kind of solved it. Um, and so this is, uh, it's like, you know, most of the time you're like, well, someone's going to tell me they're going to solve their, my problem. It's like, what are they going to do? Like, what are they going to give me? And so it's, it's all, it's, it's perspectival. We're going to talk. We're on a podcast. This is perfect. There's, we can talk about just the perspective part of this, not the practice, not how we use music in church. Not, we don't need to even necessarily get to that. There's just a simple idea in, in scripture that, um, that we're asked to pray in repetition, not vain repetition, but when Christ gives us the pattern of prayer in the Our Father, he says, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, so let's see, there's so many ways to start about this. So the idea is that we are here, the, the artist is connecting the heavens to the earth. Not, we're not looking at the earth to tell the heavens are what to be like. So this, in a nutshell, is the problem in the 20th century that came about in Christian art, in where it kind of dominated, where the idea was, what do people like? You can see this in Vatican II for the Catholics. What do people like? What are other people doing? Let's make our churches more like that. Okay, well, what type of music do people like? Well, they like this type of music. Okay, well, let's do that type of music in church. They're, uh, and Martin Shaw says it best. He said they're cozying up to and, like, I guess, borrowing from a culture that doesn't care for it, that wasn't made for it, that wasn't meant to, is, that is too small and thinking too low and borrowing from lower patterns to, that are too small to communicate the highest pattern. So, man, there's so many ways to think about this. Okay, so there's this no, notion that, like, if I go out and I'm in the world and I'm like, I see a beautiful sunset and I'm like, I'm just leaving the grocery market. I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's these colors are so stunning. So I just grab my phone and I take a picture and I post it on Facebook. Now, when I post on Facebook, everybody knows what they're looking at. They're looking at the sunset. What they've gotten used to ignoring are the telephone poles, the stupid signs, the old cars, the mediocre architecture, whatever else is around me. Um, they've learned to sort of see past that and see back into the natural thing I'm trying to show them. Uh, this is part of the big value of the vacation away to a point that's unspoiled by men, right? So the parts of the earth that have not been scarred, uh, repurposed, that they're just doing their thing left alone. Like the, this is one of the beauties of the national parks. We talk about seeing pristine nature. Well, the problem is the church is supposed to be the pristine architecture of the soul. It's supposed to present the architecture of the heavens because the architecture of the heavens is how your mind and your, your spirit and your heart ought to be ordered. And then that order ought to come out into your real life and be use that order to order the world. So the heavens come down through the person into the earth. So the Christian artist needs to understand that there's, they're an architect. Um, if this is easier to see once you become orthodox in the sense that the architecture is laid out the same way as your internal state should be laid out if it were properly ordered, meaning that there's a left side, there's a right side, there's a head and there's a feet. And those things have meaning. That's why the heads in the east, um, you know, and, and your feet are your west. There's all kinds of we can I get into the symbolism of all these things. Um, but that's maybe secondary to my point, although they're incredibly important and rich and fun to learn. Um, but the idea is, is that there's a proper way for a spirit to be ordered and God is reordering our spirit. Um, I mean, someone like John Verbeke might be talking about like your mind cathedral. Like that's the exact right idea. Like whether I like Verbeke totally or not, but that's the exact right idea. You're trying to turn your mind and your internal space into a cathedral. And so when you start to do that, you will be drawing from a different place when you make art. Your point of art is not to sell someone anything, is to show them the truth. And yeah. it's to connect the truth in ways that are surprising and meaningful and spell breaking. So there's the spell breaking aspect of it. So the, the problem when you go into, you know, let's just say a, a church environment that sees it as substitutionary uh, for the world or is looking for the world. People are used to a certain experience. So we're just going to take that experience and we're going to put our lyrics in it. You're going to find that the lyrics don't even survive very well in that environment because they can't actually 
the styles of music cannot host these deep things. It's the wrong spirit in the wrong body. So if for an artist who really gets the idea that like, okay, my job is to bring this invisible things that are not easily accessible and find ways to make them accessible through music and image um, and do it in that capacity, they're going to have a completely different goal as opposed to how do I play music to get people saved? even if they have the right idea of what it is to be saved, like even if it, like you really could do that, how do I, how do I get these people saved? Which is a noble question, um, but it's probably the wrong question because it's more like, how do I properly declare the gospel? How do I show, how do I help the heavens come to earth? And then people will respond uh, when they see that pristine spirit, that pristine, the way things should be ordered, the proper justice, everything in its right place. When they start to see those things and those things are, those things, when they're demonstrated properly, they are always beautiful. They will always hit you at a deeper spot. You might have a tear well up in your eye and you don't know why. Uh, it might have more meaning than you could ever express in words because that's why we need it, because words can never say enough. Words could never say enough. I think that's, I mean, that describes our state that we're in, right? Like that it's all built on words and ideas right now and that we're looking, we, we're trying to look past the text on the page and we're struggling to, you know, but this, I feel like this movement is that you're a part of um, that I is, is trying to offer that um, remedy that you're talking about to the problem. And I appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that perspective uh, with me. And, and I, as you were talking, um, it was, it was making me think, do you, because there are real artists within, you know, say this uh, industry, you know, the the Christian music industry. And do you think that they're they're trying to find their way towards that? Do you think that um, recently, I don't know if you know who Brooke Frazier is. Uh, she wrote, she was kind of with Hillsong for a while. And, but she, she uh, wrote some plain chant recently. And I think it's going to be released on her next work. And and it was, it, and I think p everyone's trying to reach back right now because there doesn't seem like we know what where to reach going forward, and um, I think people are going to continue to find, right. continue to find the, these spaces because of that. Um, also, the like you were talking about um, being robbed of of certain things, and it's it's a it's it's a it's living in a delusion that um, that our heart longs for, or our soul, or our psyche longs for this beauty. Um, but because there is maybe a risk that beauty can be idolatrized, then we get rid of beauty. And so um, we and and kind of growing up, but then yet we try to recreate it in this uh, affectatious kind of way, propagandic or manipulative. Uh, kind of way, like you're saying, trying to get people saved or whatever, instead of just saying, this is like, this is salvation. <laughs> you know, this is truth. And, um, and I, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to get there. Like that is, that's really helpful. Um, I'm trying to think where to go because I mean, I've always liked pop music and this is, you know, trying to help me understand like why it's because like, actual pop was actually deeper than the pop that I was like <laughs> being given. And so it felt like a, you know, that's how far removed uh, I, I feel like I was. And again, I don't want to completely poo poo on that because um, there's, there's good things and good people in those spaces. But um, I think you can poo poo the culture. I think you can. I think that's not because the culture is not necessarily sacred in 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 what they're approaching sacred again meaning we're trying to bring the heavens to the earth and there's something sacramental about it a lot of these cultures yes. don't even have a sense of sacramental yes. so how do we help them how do we help people do better right so the problem is is that this is what's so hard to evaluate about a christian experience because like so there's a friend of mine and he went to some i asked him like you know when did he because he wasn't raised a christian he grew up in a family that um I don't know what they were, or they were Christian-ish, but they didn't really go to church. And he went to some presentation at a Pentecostal church. It was this really like heavy-handed like thing about like 
you know, hell's flames and heaven's gates. And it was designed to create this altar call at the end. It was super manipulative and really creepy. And the place turned out to be a cult. Anyway, he responds to something that like, if people aren't familiar, it's called an altar call where they like, Hey, come up. If you want to be saved, you're going to be saved. And so he responds to an altar call. And, you know, that's, he tells me the story later. He's kind of embarrassed because how he found Christ. And I was like, dude, there's no embarrassment in that because you're putting the credit into the wrong thing in the wrong place is that a splinter of the cross can turn into the tree of life, Hmm. you know, if it gets under your skin. So it doesn't take, it doesn't take much of an encounter with God for that to potentially blossom into something bigger and it can happen. And it's so powerful that it cuts through all kinds of cultures, all kinds of mistakes, all kinds of problems. Uh, But I'm not concerned with the problems or addressing the problems. I'm not, I'm not a part of that. I see that as something outside of what I'm doing now. But at the same time, for the people who are stuck in those situations, well, how are they supposed to frame it up? Well, one, it's like Christ is real and you can see he's real because you've been around the weirdest people and still it marches on. People who have done it for the worst intentions, the best intentions, and still it marches on. You can see it kind of cutting through and you can see some really wonderful people coming out of some terrible examples of someone using Christ uh, for their own personal gain. And it'll still produce Christians that are genuine and transformed later in life. So it's like, well, what do you make of that? It's like, well, what I don't make of that is then anything I decide to do to to try to present that is the best option. That's not that's not what I make of it. I think that the more that the presentation is in harmony with the thing itself, the uh, the it 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 moves beyond representation and becomes a presentation. So. I think that that's an important thing to think about because also, but like, what are we inviting people into? So part of the problem is, again, we had talked about this when we were offline is that so many, it's just, it's just the pattern of so many falls from graces, especially in the Christian artist circles, like worship leaders, Christian artists, that they get so theologically weird over time. You know, the, the typical guy who's like the guy leading in the, the congregation of the guitar ends up, you know, having a problem. We don't have to, talk veiled about it. You know, I was a worship leader who was unfaithful to my wife in a completely evangelical context, you know, and that all broke down for me. Yep. And that's because you asked, why are you, why are you doing doing this podcast? Well, you know, I've been trying to reconstruct since that point. So, yes. No, you're healing. It's it's a it, yeah. you, you know, part of healing isn't just reordering yourself internally. It's reordering your life externally, and then opening yourself up to maybe the solution for the problem that no one around you had seemed to have a solution for. Uh, so I think part of the problem is is that uh, C.S. Lewis says a famished nature will not go unavenged. So there's we're connected to Christianity. A lot of people who are trying to do art in a thinner way than they imagine. Like, because, but because Christ himself is deep, they imagine their connection to be deep because they cite Christ, but it's not necessarily deep because the stakes are high in life. It doesn't, um, I mean, there, there are certain types of philosophies within Christianity or, you know, I wouldn't say they're necessarily in Christianity that make it like, you know, everything is not your responsibility and it was someone else's responsibility. I think that's a hard pill to swallow. And it's hard to make sense of even the parables Christ gives because there's always a God gives and man responds kind of going back and forth. So the problem is, is that um, when someone is engaging the world and trying to incorporate the world, like trying to incorporate the world's culture into their life, it's going to bear that fruit. It's just, there's no way around it. You can't just say, let's take the culture and use Christian words and we're fine because that culture, what emerged from uh, that chasing down of their appetites. I talk about this in the song on Shantae is that if you really, if you really can't escape those lower passions and guess what, getting invited up to like playing like a rock band at your church, uh, that's an invitation. This is an invitation. That's probably for the wrong type of thing for that setting. Not a concert. It's not a bad thing. Obviously you don't have problems with concerts. That can be a bad thing, <laughs> but the, the idea that you're asking someone to be free of these things at the same time, while they're validating the very system you're supposed to be afraid of, I think that's a terrible, like we can, we can take adjacent strategies about that. It's like, Hey, let's take an alcoholic. Okay. Right. And he's, let's make AA look just like a bar. Let's put cigarette smells and alcohol smells in the air and let's add the, you know, let's put the jukebox on and let's have the people sitting around the bar, listening to the bartender. It's like, that would be the dumbest idea ever. It's like, Hey, let's remind you of all the things you're trying to escape from. So there is this weird love affair with the world that uh, some of these modern churches have that it, 
It's just going to keep doing what it's doing. You might be worse off when it comes to controlling your passions than just someone who doesn't believe in God and just pays attention to the cause and effect. Yeah, someone because... who pays attention to the, just the cause and effect might be it... like, hey, this is actually making me kind of sad. I should stop doing it, right? It's a, it's a <laughs> and cognitive the, and, and the Christian dissonance. has the wrong idea of sin and the culture. It's a cognitive yeah. dissonance. So you, you mentioned a couple of things there about responsibility, like when, whenever you flatten out that, that Jesus did it all, that there, you know, there's nothing I can do. I can't do anything. There's a type of nihil, nihilism that comes from that. Well, I'm just a screw up. I'm just, I can't do anything. That's who I am, actually. And then there's yeah. also the other piece of it that you talked about, which is I, I used to, I was so confused by this idea that the worship is about, is supposed to be about pointing, promoting, you know, um, glorifying God. Yet for me to try to do this, I have to try to glorify myself. And I, I, I was like, I don't, I don't understand this. Um, you know, like if you're going to be, say, Christian Baxter Band, you know, Chris Tomlin, who, you know, like that you have to promote yourself, but you're supposed to be promoting, quote unquote, promoting, you know, glorifying, putting glory towards God. And, and, and like you said, there's a place for entertainment. There's a place for concert and it it just probably isn't sunday morning and you know when you talked about the stack you know you talk like it's i think it's i think it's the place is like friday night you know like there's a real and i think y'all even like exemplified this as symbolic world you know it's like friday night concert and then we're heading up the hill to liturgy you know like we weren't saying don't have it wasn't mutually exclusive um to to these things, you know, we can rock as hard as we want to, uh, you know, but uh, maybe that's not the, the place for, yeah, right, for worship. And, and the other piece that you, you know, came into talking was the world having a terrible idea of, um, of, of even ideas of sacrament, ideas of what is sacred. We treat things sacred without knowing that they're sacred. Instead, it, it's like an implied sacredness of, of things in our right. culture, whereas, supposed to be in our religious faith that the sacred should be explicit. And I've tried to like give this uh, illustration, you know, f to help people um, think where, you know, if, if, if you're at church on a Sunday morning and the mi the microphone falls over or the symbol falls over, that's awkward, but you haven't disrupted anything sacred, you know, culturally or uh, ultimately sacred, but say you're in a liturgical church and, the priest or the pastor spills communion. Like that's a different kind of response. You're dealing with something that's, you know, uh, em embarrassing or something versus like a gasp of, of a sacred thing being violated. And we don't, we don't have context for, we've robbed religion of that context or the Christian religion of that context in many ways. Even you're mentioning Vatican too. And, and uh, I kind of married, I married into a sacramental family. My wife was raised Catholic and Lutheran. And so I've had these conversations for years because here I'm doing the rock and roll thing, you know, and my in-laws were high church people. And so I'm, I've been on that journey as well. But yeah, that's just yeah. me kind of like feeding off of what you're talking about. Yeah, no, I totally hear what you're saying. Like, I mean, those, these are great points. So about the sacred, like the, you know, the communion versus a microphone getting tipped over. I think that's a really, that's a really poetic image, actually. I think that's, um, to think of them as the same thing. So the, yeah, so, but I mean, there's, there's hope for people because obviously like, okay, so a, a, a Orthodox Christian, the idea, we believe this is like the point this is maybe not exactly how they'd say it, but like the divine liturgy on Sunday is like the heavens and the earth are coming to meet. Right. And as a Christian, I'm learning the pattern of the heavens so I can go make the world like, like the heavens. Right. So the architecture, the, the garden that the world begins with, that it's, it's the proper pattering of the natural space, which is culture, which is, um, which is the heavens coming to earth and that we're supposed to do this. So, you know, when you're talking about like, let's go back to your like Friday night concert, that might be a better place for it and stuff like that. It doesn't mean that Christian stuff just has to stay inside the church, but you have to also ascertain how far it's moved out into the culture and where you're at. Are we at a pioneer? Like, If you move to a certain part of the country, you might be in more of a pioneering phase of, OK, well, maybe if maybe just a Christian rock band out there seeing Christian music is too big of a jump. Like we actually have to figure out how to 
move out from that. Uh, so that's, but the, that's an important thing. But at the same time, like we're trying to save the world with this reculturing and then not just save it in like a, like didactic kind of boring, like you stay within the lines kid. No, we're trying to restore the poetry and the beauty and this cosmic symphony that's going on. Well, if you just think about a culture that's overly sexualized, it's like, um, I think about when they think about we just all have access to whatever we want, whatever we want to. Let's just say it that way. And that's and that's when we've reached our highest point. It's like, man, that's the least poetic idea. That's like the idea I started a, a hard rock band and I got a five string bass with a low B string. And every song's got to have that low B string in it. And it's got to be the lowest note possible at all times. It's like, but no, if you're a musician, you're a poet, you realize that things are effective often in proportion to how often you don't do them. And don't do those things, right? So I think that there's, um, you have to consider these kind of patterns in life because when it comes to sex and it becomes to like, oh, do I cover my chest? What do you show? What are you allowed to show? It's like, man, like have some, have some taste, like have the patience a wonderful composer has who knows to, that there's a context for things and that you'll never know the full power of, uh, you'll like you'll never know the full power of what it means to join properly with someone if you, that's available all the time. But you hold it back. This is the same pattern of fasting and then feasting is that you hold things back so that when they're presented in the right context, it's all the more glorious. This is what art is doing. This is how this is how we dance together. We have moves we do together at the right moment. Our culture wants to do everything all at once. And and it's not really that they really want to do everything all at once. They just don't want to ever have to feel bad about anything that they want to do. And whether it's good or destructive, and the, the whole point of the church and culture is it's supposed to spread this pattern in the world. We're basically telling people like how to make the greatest music out of their life, how to be the greatest dancer, like how to, uh, how to put everything in its right place so you can see its moment where it shines, where the movie ends and it's worth a standing ovation. Uh, Christianity is trying to help people have those moments and our culture's just there slapping paint all over the room, never mind the canvas. And I don't want to borrow from that idea at all. Like, I think that's absolutely backwards. I think that if you, if you rely on these things, if you rely on these things, the leisures, the luxury, these kind of indulgences in life, eventually you'll have none of what you liked about in the first place. And you'll turn your life into a, a waiting room at a dentist's office where hopefully you get a decent magazine or something good comes on the TV to pass the time. Cause that's what it turns into. And, and meanwhile, uh, Christianity is trying to, and especially for the Christian artists, trying to, you know, help participate in like that first miracle we see in the Gospel of John, where he's at the wedding feast and the and Christ turns the water into wine, and the wedding feast, uh, you know, master is angry because he kept the best wine for the end. We give that up front, and then people get drunk and things fade out and entropy sets in and goes downhill. But the Christian experience is the opposite of that. It's the idea that you get younger as you get older, and and things seem to age backwards and. So I think that, um, yeah, I think that this is a massive problem. And I think that anybody who would consider themselves a Christian or a church should not think about creating Christian art that's trying to borrow um, from that lower pattern. It's just you're, you're not going to do it. Like you're going to be stuck in the same patterns of the people that use those things themselves. And you're going to be worse off because you're going to hide it. And you're going to get in this back and forth cycle of, of obsessing over something, going after it, and then feeling bad. And then as soon as you stop feeling bad, going back to it, like that's the cycle you'll be in. If that's the natural cycle of things, this kind of yeah. you eat and then you get hungry and you eat and you get hungry and you eat and you get hungry. Um, but there's more to life than that, especially if you want to really experience like what we've been given here, um, the way it was meant to, and then ride that all the way up for eternity. Well, so I think that, that it's very confusing to the culture, what Christian are presenting i think it, they're just presenting another philosophy in in this world and that's not at all what's being presented or like it, it, even worse sometimes it's just represented like everything's merely symbols well that's, so the christian that's, artist should understand what's at stake when it comes to that. that's that is the problem when you said merely symbol because there's this desire to bring heaven to earth but you can't say that you actually are in that theology you know yeah, this yeah. you know that you actually not sacramental really are yeah and so that creates a problem because that's the actual desire that's the desire is to for manifestation you know and you see that in the charismatic movements they want the manifested a, a physical manifestation of god and um and 
you want these transcendent experiences within Protestantism. They're seeking after transcendence, but they're not seeking af after, after an actual uh, ontological reality of heaven and earth. And like you said, you, you wrap it up by saying they're not sacramental. So mm -hmm. yes, or they don't, even the ones that in their confessions are sacramental have probably abandoned that as, an, as a reality of their, of their telos for worship. I, I would say possibly. And, and I think that that's why yep. uh, that we need like a, a five senses tell us and, and an engagement into our, uh, in our, in our worship, because we were robbed of it uh, when we've, when we have called certain parts of it evil. And I'd also think, I mean, this is probably the most controversial last thing I get around saying, but that is that like we kind of, so much of Christianity is is it's not um, in its theology Gnostic, but in its practice Gnostic. Um, because it's like, well, you have the knowledge and then, okay, so we're doing the right, quote unquote, doing the right thing. But that, um, but really all this other stuff is bad. And, you know, so um, it's really just goes back to being about the, the, not the knowledge and, and where it, something like that I'm hearing from you is like, no, there's so much good. There's so much good. And it, it points to something true. It points to something true. And, uh, but that some of that's, I think has been displaced, um, in, in, you know, in the West or, you know, in our current state of most of what people know about Christianity, what I've, ex what I experienced about Christianity. I don't know if you have thoughts on that. So it broke up a little bit there, um, but you there was a, you, the part I missed. I think that was the most important was you said there was a controversial thing you say about it was a Gnostic a statement about Gnosticism and, and how it really yeah that to that kind of we yeah that that we kind that kind of exists in our culture because the right having the right knowledge but like everything else is evil like that that's huge and you know the satanic panic the stuff that you're going over I think on your new podcast you know oh yeah like, okay. No, this is a great point you're making. Um, okay, so I, the parable of the seed and the sower is probably one of the easier ways to see this problem. And the, I, the problem of Gnosticism is the seed that falls on rocky soil. So it's, it's got plenty of revelation. It's exposed to light, like the idea that this is, but it doesn't take root, right? It doesn't actually develop proper practices and doesn't turn out to be something we act on. This is, a, this is one of the big letdowns of reducing the gospel into a paradigm that you can sell it and make it transactional. This is a terrible idea. This is what happens when you do that, because now it's a thing I have to believe. And you it's and of course, you have to believe it. Like everything begins with a belief. Like I have to believe that my legs are going to work. or I would never try to stand up. If I didn't believe my legs were going to work or I could walk. Why would I try to stand up? They're like if you can't see it, why would you go there? So of course everything, but there's there's other things that the belief that that seed does not turn into a thing. It doesn't bear fruit. Does, it's not salvific unless you unless it motivates you some other way into action, like faith expressing itself through love is the only thing that counts. So um, I think that the reduction. It's an invitation to Gnosticism. The way the gospel has been reduced in certain circles. I think the idea that. What's at stake is that, you know, God's counting beans and that he's got a bunch of beans in a row and that, listen, my job when I present the gospel is to explain to you, you have this terrible rap sheet against you and that God's mad about it. And here come the flames when you die. It's like, oh, no, what do I do? Well, you do Jesus. And Jesus, basically, he took the flames for you and now he cleared the rap sheet. Um, I think that's a, a mistaken paradigm to slam it into because it causes... Well, it causes too much discontinuity with other things. It's like uh, in First John, it says God is love. In First Corinthians 13, it says that love keeps no records of wrong. It's like, so if the state, if like, just like from a child's like perspective of theology, like the smallest inquiry into what's being given to me is not the story. It can't be the story. It's contradictory. It has nothing to do with God's character and what's the real problem here. It has to do with more of like a reduction to crime and punishment, everything, right? Which is like the, you know, punishment is when you first learn like what a moral is as a kid. Like you learn something's wrong because something happens you don't like.
That's the stage one. That's the lowest understanding you could possibly have of what's going on. That understanding is important because that understanding gets bootstrapped into maybe things will go better for me and other people and they'll think better of me if I do the right thing. All the way up to, hey, maybe I live life for an audience of one. Maybe God, if I get, if I do it his way, it'll be better for everyone, whether they like me or not. You know, so there's like a way to like move up through that. And so the cultures reduce this. So when you reduce it to a matter of faith alone or belief alone or something internal, they don't see like that faith and actions are married. Like if the two don't, you have to have another level to check what you believe. So there's a, if you say you believe something, but then you won't do it or you, you know, or you say, oh, I believe like you said, cognitive dis distance earlier, I believe the cigarette's going to kill me, right? Like, why am I still smoking then? Like, what's really going on? It's not the story. I have the right story. Cigarettes will kill me, right? But what's going to change then? Because I've told myself the right thing in my head and it hasn't taken root in my body. So I think part of what you have in the, con I think that moral therapeutic culture um, bounds out of this, the idea of the self-affirmation, the self-declaration, the self-crowning, that I am a Christian or I am this thing. Um, it's, there's no outside checks for any of these things. This is why you talk to people and they say things like, well, God told me this thing. It's like, well, how am I supposed to check into that? Like, what's my, te what's my epistemology for if you actually heard the voice of God or not? Um, this is why Orthodox people kind of, we don't say those kind of things or you shouldn't anyway. Um, but anyway, so when you get into the Gnosticism of the culture, we get into the self-declaration. Everything is self-declaration now. Everything is self-authoring. Everything is, is your belief alone in the body. So if I believe I'm a girl, I'm a girl. Um, like, well, only thing true in that statement was if I actually believe I'm a girl. Like, that's the true part of the statement. But I didn't, nothing changes on the outside. So our world has gotten so Gnostic and so backwards. And I think it's because of this kind of distortion in what's at stake. And it's also come in through this, this terrible seed has come in through Christianity and this sort of, like, just believe, just believe. And you're fine. It's like the demons believe. Um, demons know exactly who Jesus is. Like that's not what's at stake necessarily that, but that's where, that's where accountability begins. You believe, and then you go and do it. So, well, well, when someone wants to push against this problem we're having is that people are living and they, they really feel this way. They, they, like they believe inside that there's something different than they are on the outside. And our culture doesn't really have a way to reconcile that. And it's been reinforced over and over again that you just get to self author those things. And so the problem is, is that everything in life, it has to happen in some sort of epistemology or what are we really talking about now? Like I know that beauty is like hard to have an epistemology for beauty. I think that there, uh, there is something like that, but you know, what's the epistemology for my internal faith? Well, Christ gives us those tests. He says like, Hey, where your treasure is, there is your heart. If you obey me, uh, you obey my teachings, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. He explains that all these things have to, you have to complete the cycle. And uh, so the Gnosticism in Christianity, where we think we, you know, basically something we were handed from like 400, 500 years ago, where church was supposed to be a little bit of music, then we sit down and listen to a really long lecture, because what's really important is that I need to change your mind. It's like, yes, you need to change your mind, but you also need to change what you do. And generally, the people that just think you need to change the mind, what they're telling you to do in your mind is wrong also, like, cause they haven't tested it in the world and they haven't been able to confirm that in the world. I think there's some, uh, you know, some ideas that people present that are so far away from being testable. Like the idea that, Oh, I don't know. God just, he could send anyone to heaven, but he doesn't, he just picks a few and those people had no choice in the matter. And there were really no stakes except for that. They were a witness to this sort of deterministic God. It's like, okay, well, how do I test that? If that's true. It's like you can't like your your experience of the world is going to feel like that your decisions matter they have consequences and they can negatively affect other people and yourself or positively affect other people and yourself so there's there's all these abstract ideas where people can like i use this example at the conference of like my my roommate who used to lay the suit out on his bed like he <laughs> slept next to on his queen bed his suit that he would wear the next day he'd lay it all out and look at it and that would have been even weirder if he never put the suit on but I think what people are being tempted into in this sort of Gnostic view is that they have to get this like suit perfect. And that's the, that over there, that's the guy. It's like, no, you have to wear the suit. It's like the point. It's the point. You have this, you have a husband and wife relationship between your internal immaterial spirit and your actual body that has power to act and multiply actions in the world. Like there, we have a marriage relationship in our body and our, and everywhere. And so uh, Gnosticism is saying is it's spiritual misogyny. 
if you want to put it that way. It's the idea that we can be fruitful and multiply if we're just a bunch of men. Let's, for example, you could you could say it that way. So I think that's the the massive danger. I think the good news is is that um, that's uh, that's rapidly becoming a uh, a bad idea. Like in many people's eyes, like they're starting to learn. It's like you just can't get up there and sing a bunch of music and try really hard and figure things out and be free from sin at the same time. It's like you just can't try really hard or you can't think about. Yeah, you can't you know, believe really hard. It's like that Bob Newhart character he used to play. What was that? Sorry, you, you robot. You can't believe really hard. And then, you know, you can't just believe or think really hard like you were saying. You have to do. You have to confess. Yeah. You have to, you have to do. It's both. Partic participate. And they're not separate. Yeah. yeah. They're yeah. not separate things. Like, that's the problem, is that they are separate things categorically, but they're you're not going anywhere unless both things are going in that direction. Yes. So you're not really going, you're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself if you're just acting, you know, with the hopes that just the actions alone will save you. Of course, the Bible's really clear about that as well, too. So, um, but what does that mean for our culture? Our culture is absolutely confused. So you have two, two abuses going on at the same time. And they think everything's about believing the right thing, even not outside of Christian circles too. It's kind of the same thing. You have to have your political ducks in the row mentally. And then in your body, you're supposed to not be bound by any tradition or ritual or practice. You're supposed to, you're supposed to listen to what it's telling you to do. And that anybody who tells you that maybe you shouldn't act on those impulses um, is being oppressive or something like that. And I think that it's like, just imagine if you get together an orchestra, like of, mu of musicians who believe that, right? That, oh, we're all here to make beautiful music. We agree what beautiful music is, but everybody's going to do whatever the hell they want all the time. It's like, is the, is the orchestra going to come together in a unified fashion that way? Like, no, it can't, right? You have to play certain notes at certain times for them to be beautiful. And I just think that's the right analogy. It works with food too. Um, you know, the, the recipe alone is great. You can read a recipe on paper. And if you know what the heck you're looking at, you know it's going to be good because you've had an experience with food and you can actually go and test the recipe. But the recipe doesn't really exist until you make it and then eat it. There's this pattern in the Bible and it talks about like wisdom. By wisdom, the house is conceived. Through understanding, the house is built. And through um, knowledge, the rooms are filled. This is the same like uh, Trinitarian pattern of like the father, no one's seen the father. He's the pattern of all things. He's the, the, where, where these ideas begin. He's the architecture. Christ is the assembly of that architecture in a way we can see it. And the Holy spirit is the wind blowing across the land, which is how we know something's being used properly. So if I, tomorrow you and I open an antique shop, we have the idea, we go out into the world, we look for the type of antiques we'd want. We collect it. So we had the wisdom to see what an antique shop could be. We go out, we collect all the antiques, we put them in the shop. And then the last thing we do is we let a bull run around in there. It's like, right, okay, that's the wrong spirit. Or kids play rugby in there. It's like, this is the wrong way to fill that space. But when the face is built, when this space is filled properly, someone who comes in who's looking for those things, and it's like, oh my gosh, you guys have had the right idea. You've actually curated the right things. I'm going to purchase this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this with me and use it. That's that moment is when the beauty begins to emanate, when the cycle is completed. So now the person who had the idea in the beginning sees the whole cycle go all the way through. This is the Christian life. This is how you actually learn to gain uh, dominion over these lower appetites. And so when you're in a circle where people are telling you like your affection is the most important thing, like if you go to a football game and you're cheering really hard, you might be worshiping football. I'm like, that's not worship. That's like, that's the totally wrong connection. People are allowed to be, a, a, have affection and love for lower things as long as they understand where they, they fit in ontologically. And if they're living a Christian life that's completing that cycle of the, um, you know, the pattern, the body, and then the use of that body, the animation of that body, they're going to become over time uh, more immune to the things that would distract an ordinary person who thinks that it's just a matter of maintaining some kind of belief in my heart and affection towards God, but not really doing anything different than anyone else in the rest of the world. You said something about the football game that clicked for me in a way that, you know, in, in this culture, um, oh, no, you're worshiping football. You've made an idol out of football. I'm sure you've heard that language or like you were just articulating. But that is the reason that that yeah, is cool. even that is even a concern is because we actually view church we actually view church and worship the same as we view football we actually 
are bringing it down. And so it's actually, it yeah. is compared to football. Um, it's just an, a kind of another form of entertainment or affection, like you were saying, as opposed to transcending that level of reality and being something sacred. Um, and I, I think that's, that's a big mm -hmm. problem. And <clears throat> you, man, you had something else going there, but that one was, that one really hit me uh, deeply. And, yeah, I took a lot in there. Sorry. <laughs> no, um, no, you're you're just uh, you've obviously thought a lot about these things for a long time, you know, deeply, and uh, and so you have a lot to share, and a lot of good, and you and you are passionate about, hopefully, you know, um, what beauty will save the world. That line is is a dirt poor Robin's line that like I can I can hear the melody in my head from that song. Um, you know, you, you were trying to change the world, what you're doing. So on that, like, uh, you know, one of the reasons I reached out to you was because you, you said that Jordan sent you an e Jordan Peterson sent you an email, um, you know, and he invited you to come out on tour with him. Yep. Um, and so you had an opportunity, uh, in a different way to help affect and, and change and, and lend your voice in that way. So what was, how did that happen? And what's that, what was that experience like? Yeah. So I think Jonathan's been talking to him about us for a while. So I met another guy, um, his name is Marshall. He did some music with Jordan Peterson and Marshall is great. Um, but he was talking about like six months ago, like Jordan showing him some of our stuff. And I was like, Oh, that's kind of neat. So anyway, um, yeah, but Jonathan's been doing his little thing. He's a little, he's, he's subtle network networker and he just drops seeds. And so I think that Jordan decided to take him up on it. Cause they, uh, so often Jordan's son does music for, um, the store and they'll bring other musicians in but um they i got an email with jonathan just you know reintroducing me to jordan who i've been around a bunch of times but apparently didn't have my email address or my phone number um and it was basically like hey and, uh, jordan got in there wanted us to do a bunch of dates coming up wanted to see if we were available put us in touch with his tour manager and then, you know, Jordan, I don't know if he sleeps. He probably sleeps less than a normal person. But just like getting random emails from him in the middle of the night about songs he likes and what he might like to hear. <laughs> and I thought that was kind of fun. But it was weird right away because so there's a there's a problem. There's a problem we've always run into with any mention or association of Jordan Peterson. It even happens for us when we uh, just jump from being associated with Jonathan Peugeot is that our audience like is not a politically like bound under the same political view they're not bound under the same religious view there's all types and in fact that our band is a little more like a carnival seems to really attract uh people who like to dress up uh let's just say it that way and uh we love like these people are so interesting to us we've always found an encouragement that people are um finding some kind of transcendent story that people who in real life might even be standing at opposite sides with pickets and <laughs> picketing signs in their faces screaming at each other are finding commonality in what we're talking about because I've always believed that there was a way to transcend the political. I think the political is definitely too low of a thing for Christian, a level for Christians to live at because politics is by its design causes you to label and identify people as outside and people who are the problem in the world. Like, you know, it, it, you spend all your time looking at the problems and uh, as a Christian, that's not going to be helpful for me. Like I don't really pay much attention to people's, posts on Facebook and stuff like that. Cause you find yourself mad at someone you sit next to a church, you were getting along with fine until you heard their views on Roe v. Wade or something like that. So um, our audience really is not involved in those things, but every once in a while, like, you know, they they'll talk about things that we never talk about. Like Jordan right now is he's going after pride month and, you know, Jonathan will have his videos where he talks just plainly about Christian positions. And I appreciate, I appreciate that there's, there needs to be all types of things in the world. Like, you know, Jordan doing, Jordan being such a bold voice, he seems to be like the tip of the spear for people who don't feel like they have a voice necessarily in certain ways or don't know how to say it or, or talk about something. He seemed to be the tip of the spear to like stiffen the spines of other people and feel bold. And there's other ways of doing that. Like people at the Daily Wire, when they do this, I don't really love it, but they'll just find like a mentally ill version of their opponent. And then suddenly... Like, I wouldn't know who Dylan Mulvaney was if they didn't tell me who Dylan Mulvaney was. I wouldn't know that I'm supposed to be mad at Dylan Mulvaney. I would never be. I'd meet this person in real life. I'd be like, well, this what this interesting person up to. Let me get to know him a little better. That's that would be my view in person. But because, of the, you know, people bringing these things up and, and shoving them in your face, it has a tendency to other eyes. So I, I avoid, avoid politics. Uh, our political messaging is always the same. It's like, guys, get your head out of it. Like. 
you can engage in it, but it's not, it's not the, this is not the level where everything's happening. This is not how the world's going to be redeemed. The world's not going to be redeemed because somebody read a bunch of statistics and came up with a solution to solve the problem on the, got the problem wrong and solved it on the wrong level. It's not going to happen. That's not how the heavens are going to come to earth. So I, um, the problem with Jordan is that as soon as you just mentioned his name, it's like he came to one of our shows and like people were mad about it. It was like, Someone actually told me um, that I should have unplugged and left when he came in the room. And I said, that's a lot of power to give to one guy. They're like, everybody would have understood. I was like, no, nobody would have understood. It's like a handful of people out of a room of 500 anywhere that don't like Jordan Peterson unless they're gathered for that. It's a certain small percentage of people that really hate him. Everybody else kind of gets that he's spending a little bit of common sense. Doesn't say it how I would say it. So my position is very different on these subjects. Like, let's just take that subject. And I, but I don't want to get, the problem is I don't want to explain it. I'm making music. I want to talk about the music, like to people. I don't want to, I don't want to get out and have to explain to my audience everything I believe about everything. Those are not hills I'm, uh, I need to die on. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of what I believe or embarrassed of it. I just don't, it, it's counterproductive. Like, how are they going to understand me? So the problem right now we're having is there's been a massive turnaround, like all kinds of words you couldn't say, you can say again, there's, you can pretty much become the most popular person on Netflix by dunking on the LGBTQ plus community. Um, that like people see that as a net positive. I'm like, we, I don't think we got any closer to what's causing this, right? Whether you're on the side that doesn't think of it as a problem, thinks of it as an evolution or whether you're on the side that thinks of it as a problem, like, is this real or was it just as some conservatives believe that somebody is just telling us a story and some people are believing it or telling or, you know, it's just the narrative, the Gnostic side of it. And so I think conservatives are terribly wrong on the Gnostic side of this. I think that there's things all the way from uh, there's a lot of internal confusion because we're we're so uh, separated from our bodies in our life. We're, we spend so much time on screens. We, we spend our time living in a zoo instead of what we were made for. It's like when we brought a, grizil a, grizilla, a gorilla into the zoo, you know, in the 1940s, and they put him in a cinder block room with the bars. And they're like, gee, why isn't he acting like a gorilla anymore? Like he's not antisocial, he won't eat properly, he's got diarrhea, he won't procreate. What have we done? Some genius comes along and is like, hey, maybe if we look, make it look a little more like the jungle, like the gorilla won't be so mad. And, um, but then eventually the gorilla will still try to escape. Even if you make it perfect, you remove all the problems. You're still going to want to go out and have a life in the world. So there's a problem in this current world is that we think that humans are infinitely malleable, malleable to our environment. And there's a point which we're not. And I think we've crossed that point. I think you're seeing it in people that we've crossed the point where we built a world that we weren't meant for uh, to some degree, at least. On top of that, when, who knows what all, like, you know, if you want to get into, like, the, the medical side of things, like, who knows to what all the prescription drugs are doing to us and these all these toxins we've, in, we've involved ourselves in? Who knows what the light of screen hitting our eyes? There's a, probably a physical problem. There's also probably a narrative problem. There's all kinds of problems um, that are going on in the world. And that, you know, so we can't dismiss that there's a massive number of people who are feeling a different way than we would have expected a hundred years ago. That's for sure. And so what do you do about that? So I don't think the solution was, Oh, we get to make fun of them again. Like that wasn't a real solution. So that's kind of not where we live in this. So um, it's hard for us to associate with people that are having that debate and argument because our position is, is to um, I don't think it's unchristian in any capacity at all. Uh, it just takes too long to explain because people don't listen. They just think you're saying, oh, you this guy. Like someone messaged me on Twitter. They're like, do you like gay people? I was like, which one? Like, mm -hmm. what are you even asking me? Like, I, I don't really even think of gay people. I think of people. And some people like people of the same sex. I don't think that that's, I'll be very clear. I don't think it's going right when that happened. But I want to know why it happened. I don't think you're bad because you have those feelings, right? I don't think that's what's going on. Um, but I think, you know, that we're made to, we, we all know how the world exists. We all know the world exists because people have kids and that's, that's definitely still should be thought of as normative. Um, but people do not know how to have this discussion. Uh, I like, even what I said here can get taken out of context and probably will people like to follow us, get some kind of hint that we're associated with Christianity and they want to dig in and find everything they can find on us is incriminating, but they don't know. They, the problem with this, that is they don't know what I'm like in real life. They don't know what I'd be like. They don't know if I'd be their friend. They don't, we'd, we'd get along. Like they don't, they don't understand what that go like. And I certainly would not have some immediate prejudice once they presented themselves as something that I might consider is not like, maybe something's gone wrong here. Maybe, like they, they're not going to get bad treatment from me. So 
it's just an impossible subject to get into. So we kind of don't. So that's always the thing I'm afraid of with, with that is that I might be um, with the chance to do these things. And as much as I love Jordan, that they could cause some kind of problem for us that I don't, a battle I don't need to fight because it's not really the battle we're fighting. That's, you know, I, we don't, I don't, as a Christian, I don't think I go out and address other people's mistakes as like my means to being a Christian. I, I just don't think I should even see him most of the time. I think that my mode of engaging the world is with the enthusiasm about what I've given, like the beggar who found the bread and telling other people where to find the bread, maybe, as opposed to going out and being like, Hey, I see you smoking that cigarette. You know, that's bad for you. It's like, why do you start there? Like, like let the, let people come to Christ and let them, you know, let them learn you know, the proper order of things and hopefully you experience some healing that way. So instead it, of just that, correcting, making, trying to force people to believe what I believe who don't believe what I believe. It sounds like that that invitation came to you with a lot of weight. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, my, I, my, said, my, I said, yes, of course, obviously, sorry, I'm opening water. It's okay. My, my experience with, with, uh, I don't know Jordan, but my experience with the conversation around him has always been frustrating kind of, you know, for similar reasons because of his, the politically charged side of who he is. Cause even when I went and saw him this year, uh, in Little Rock, you know, he, he did his thing and he talked about the Bible and he made like two, maybe three jokes about quote unquote woke and, and at the end, you know, I was listening to some, you know, probably late 20 year old guys and they were, oh, did you hear him? Like, that's like all they heard. And I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That's all you heard? Like, I, as I was just, you know, and, and that is a problem with communicating, uh, the, transcending that, that part of what he's done in search for people, myself, maybe yourself included. And, um, so, so it did, yeah, it sounds like that was obviously, like you said, you said, you said yes. Uh, and, and I guess you're, I don't know if you're dealing with yeah. any fallout now or anything like that, but less than I anticipated. I think we got through most of that already over the years with just other things, you know, and the summit was kind of the last, I think we broke off the last people that were really mad at that, or at least following us to the point where they could get mad. I'm sure there's going to be waves of people coming in who, feel ripped off when they liked a band that was friends with Jordan Peterson or something like that. But I mean, I would defend Jordan, like not on every point, but just on a, like, let's, how was, how about on a personal level? So we show up, you know, we practice for the gigs. It was kind of short notice. We show up and they're absolute sweethearts. Like, I mean, I've known Tammy for a while and I don't just mean to me, I mean to everyone. So the random people working in the event, holding the doors, keeping people out of the backstage area, they're, you know, very often union people, not delighted to see you, expecting you to overlook them. By the end of each night, those people were like, they had like a family gathering kind of warm vibe. Like it was like they like they wished every night would go like that because they were seen, they were heard, like in a very modern, like, you know, kind of affirmation sense. They were seen, they were heard, they were listened to. People were genuinely interested in them. Everybody backstage, the Petersons leading the way are super cool with everyone they see and treat them with dignity. So like on a personal level, people can say whatever they want about that. I don't imagine that's like, like, you know, like how Hitler was acting like in his day to day life. Like, I don't know, like when they, when they talk, I hear them talk about someone online and then you have an experience with them in real life. And it's like, man, you, I've been around them with the people they say that they hate and they're, they're lovely. So I would totally defend them on a personal note. Obviously you can't, defend everyone on every level because you're not with them all the time but all, all of our experiences like there's nothing but like no i'd be i'd be caving to someone else to say no to this who who doesn't get to determine who i hang out with like that's not what it's not something i'm going to give permission for the world at large to do it's like no if there's value and if i can learn something they can learn something for me we can work together um like i decide that they, the, the group doesn't get to decide that so that's why we said yes at the end of the day but um they're super genuine people. I mean, um, he, like, I, like, I think Jonathan said this before he is, he's exactly what you get, um, on stage, except maybe like in person, he's a little more of a rascal, it's really funny, uh, surprisingly funny. And, um, but he's talking about the same things, interested in the same things, you know, you'll just get him singing a random song or something like that every once in a while, you know, something funny cutting up. Um, 
so they're they're pretty incredible with that um the shows themselves went great uh the, it's really neat it's really weird because it does kind of function like a pseudo church experience i don't know what it was like when you went um but it was definitely like because we kind of opened in music and then came back out and closed and i was like hmm, i might rework some of this a little bit if i was going to suggest that future and then he talked about the bible the whole time and i was like this is like some kind of weird parachurch thing to some degree but not totally but th- what it had in common was the fact that the audience it's hard to go to a nightclub and find an audience that's there to discover the meaning of their life or searching for the meaning in their life or trying to press into something deeper and trying to learn and you know and trying to do better like the idea of what assembles people at the normal concert is is much less cohesive than that so it's really cool to be able to sit there and then you know, in a format where the lyrics could be heard really well and just be able to connect and have eyesight with people who understood more than an average audience would for sure what the heck we're talking about. So that part of it was super cool too. Man. So um, we're kind of coming up on some time here, but like, so what's next for you? You've also, you're you're your creative soul. You talked about that early in your story. You've made movies. Um, Yeah, and... What what's kind of on the horizon for you for you guys for Dirt Four Robins for Neil DeGrade? Yeah, so we're playing more now coming up. Um, so we've got a bunch of shows. We're doing a live record next. Um, we're gonna take one new song. Uh, so we have a song called Leviathan. You're a drummer, right? Uh, I kind I was of. I was mainly a, a guitar guitar yeah, and singer. You have, I mean, you have a drum set too because I like the drums yeah. in this one. Uh, so there's a song called Leviathan we did a while ago, which really has a throwback to like 70s, like it has this long jam instrumental section that's kind of progressive in the middle. And I'm making the counterpart to that called Behemoth. Um, so it's going to be a similar vibe. Um, but we're basically building a live record around that. We're going to do it with a video crew so people can see us playing. The guys we play with are so awesome. So it'll be a full band including brass and strings and, and an audience. So we're going to do a live record next. And then after, then after that, we're, uh, my next story is a Western fairy tale. We're doing concept record around. Um, and it really is like a parallel of the harrowing of hell. Um, except it's, I guess actually a better parallel with Samson. Like let's say, let's say Samson. So there's a character takes place that the, when the old West is dying and this new modern world of advertising is coming in and taking over everything and repatterning the world. And it's about what happens to the spirits at that time and how they compromised as part of this and became hybrids. So it's a very strange story, but it's a Western fairy tale, and um, it'll have more of a Western sound. So like you may have noticed if you dug into our catalog at all, like, hey, Queen of the Night's got this vaudevillian, dark cabaret kind of throwback 30s, 40s jazz thing, as well as being a little bit modern at the same time. And then like Dead Horse and Firebird have this, you know, nostalgic, a little bit of 80s rock, um pop kind of vibe to it but still hopefully still sounds like us you can still tell it's the same band well this one's going to have a lot more of like a cinematic western like uh the good the bad and the ugly kind of vibe um you know jangly guitars and western vocals and uh but still be us same kind of songwriting and and whatnot uh to fit the story so we're we're going to be bending into that genre. I'm um, doing a Kickstarter coming up. We get vinyl and uh, I have a deck of cards. Oh, I should have had them nearby. Um, a deck of cards that goes with the new project Firebird. Um, so we're doing that and we're going to be playing a bunch of live shows. We get some conferences coming up and it, there's hopefully Jordan asked us to do some more things in the future. That could be fun because he's going to Europe, like free trip to Europe, bro. Ah. Like, yeah. I'm going Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, I'll do that. See, and and what was fun? Okay, so what's fun is that our kids come out in the road with us now. So they're old enough. When we were young, we stopped. When they were younger, we stopped touring because it was madness. Not that they were too bad or whatever, but we like what kind of life is that for a kid? Like no friends on the road, no lessons, no leagues, nothing. Like nothing normal. Just they're gonna be the weirdest people, and so we were so afraid of that. So. But now we brought them back and they're actually like an asset to us in the sense that people see kids backstage and they're like, oh, no, you know, and then they're great. No, they've been great so far anyway. So, (laughs) Um, but it's been fun taking them out there and showing them stuff. And they're like filming us from the side of the stage and stuff. It's kind of cute. That was a really cute moment for me. And and we were in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, and there was like probably like around 10,000 or more people out there. 
and we're performing and I look over the side of my stage and, you know, Ruslan KD, he's like our YouTuber. He had given my son, he was there with us and he gave my son this 360 camera to film with. So he was filming and my other daughter was taking pictures. And then I looked, turned to look at Kate to see if she was seeing it. And as I looked over Kate, um, Jordan was standing over Tammy, like singing the lyrics and dancing with her. And uh, it was just so weird. It was so weird to have my kids like at this big show. And then Jordan Peterson, like and Tammy singing on the side (laughs) of the stage. Um, that was a really weird experience. Like that's not like something I expected in my rock and roll Rolodex, you know, to to show up as like a moment, but it did. And now I have it in here. <laughs> so we're gonna be doing some more touring, playing live all the way through. We've got stuff booked all the way up through next February, but we have not announced it. Um, we're playing a con. I think the last thing I have in the books is in February. We're doing a conference in San Diego. So that's pretty much it. Well, there's it, there's a, you know, this. This network of uh, meaning making is growing and, uh, you know, trying to get, I even think it was helpful for you from the journey that you've been on. You meet this guy who's kind of a little bit more vanilla, let's say, and, and it's helping distill some of these really deep and helpful and needed ideas to hopefully more people, even though my audience is pretty small but it's it's out there and it's real and it's happening no no man well i think about non-denominational churches like you've got a bigger your view totals are higher than like a lot of these little things that people build the whole church for so not that you're making church here but i just mean it's not nothing either what you're doing already so that's good and i think yeah you have a good guest you're asking good questions i think uh these things are important um obviously you know the the thing I love about what Jonathan was doing with YouTube is that eventually when people were like, well, what should I do? He was like, well, go to church, you know? And, uh, I think that's great. I think that this, this as a a funnel to better things, you know, especially since the world lives in the space where where people are looking for information, like, Oh, like that's the problem too. Like you, you ever get in that cycle where you're like, there's just, you're just not right. And you just keep showing up waiting for like some kind of message in the sermon that's going to like suddenly fix everything. Right. And so the world is looking for that, those kind of answers. But I mean, it's also helpful to tell them that like, okay, well, maybe it's not just what you think is the problem. Like, maybe there's some things you could do differently too. So um, I think that's really important when it comes to like some of the things we've talked about today, when it comes to, okay, I want to embody the highest things in my life. What am I doing? Well, don't be a Gnostic. That's yeah. for sure. Like that's only half the coin. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then look at these things. And look at these things this way. So here's one of the things. So you, you heard me talk at the summit. I don't try to be an academic. Um, I mean, there's Jordan speaking, Father Stephen speaking, like all these people are speaking like this. And I, I've not tried to modify myself so I sound like them because my own experience in the world was something like this. I, I had some wonderful music teachers that were academically really sound. In ninth grade, I had the craziest music teacher who was not academically sound at all. I think he was, he might've like drank too much all the time. He would come in hungover. He had this awesome Afro. He was an incredible trumpet player. Um, and he would come in and just do the most random things. He would play like a 20 minute trumpet solo and then go to sleep. He pulled me aside. He realized I could learn faster and just started teaching me stuff. But what he was teaching me wasn't just the academic side, was the idea that like, no, listen, like music is supposed to do something to people. Like it's, it needs to do something to people. Like it needs to not be right, right? It needs to be powerful. Like, and, and right in the sense that it's like, you didn't get all the rules right. You know, like that's not what you're worried about. You're not worried about like, there's actually might be power in the guitar getting a little out, bent too far out of tune here. It might say something to an audience. So his thing was like, you're just, you're going to the edge of the stage and you're trying to impose like something savory, something rich, something undeniable to people. You're not trying to make, like you're not trying to make it look good on paper. You're not trying to do those kind of things. So I think that uh, when it comes to the discussion of art and, and these kind of things, even a YouTube channel, it's like, you're just, you're trying to like, you're trying to do something memorable. You're trying to impact people. You're trying to um, create an experience for them. You're not trying to just get everything right. Hey, it's good. If you get everything right and you create the experience, that's both sides of the coin. That's great. But uh, I think people in the, in these circles too tend to, to, hang a little too heavily on like totally systematizing what they're talking about or getting just the right word for the right thing. But at the same time, you can body language says a lot. Rhythm says a lot. Examples say a lot things. If you try to domesticate things, they, uh, 
they get a little boring. They can't have a life yeah. of their own in the world. So you, you can't totally domesticate this experience. At the same time, you don't want it to be too wild because then it's gamey and nobody wants to eat it. So, you know, <laughs> you've got those wonderful challenges ahead of you as you're finding your identity with your new channel. I love that you're doing it. Thanks, man. I love your reasons too. I think they're great. Well, I appreciate it. It's a really exciting opportunity to get to connect with you. Kind of, uh, I, you know, because um, in this space, I haven't, you know, I, I, I've done the, in my past life, the, the artist, the social media, the music and all that kind of stuff, you know, but, uh, so there was somebody out there that's, I, that I had some resonance with, but was kind of heavy in this space. And, and that's been a lot of fun. So I really appreciate it. And, um, uh, yeah, man, hopefully they'll Good make man. some to do it again. And hopefully we'll have a better connection with our <laughs> internet next time. And, uh, but yeah, dude, Neil, yeah, we worked around it. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in and staying with us until the end of today's episode. Your support and digital connection is deeply meaningful to me. If you've enjoyed our conversation and believe that these conversations bring real value to your life and in this space, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel. By doing so, you'll be helping me reach the goal of starting channel memberships, where we can continue building a TLC this little corner of the internet sub community. My hope is to be able to further cultivate digital community on this channel, to be a space where kindred souls can engage in deeper, more intimate discussions from various corners of the corner. Thank you again for being a part of this journey.